Hey everybody, welcome to ARC 330. Um, today we're going to talk about production-ready prototyping. My name is Martin Bishop and I'm a Chief Technologist for our UK public sector business. And I'm joined today by Fabian Labatt, who's a Senior Solutions Architect in our financial services business. We've both been with AWS for about six years and lots of experience dealing with different kind of customers. And all customers um, that we engage with have shared that they, they really want to go from idea to implementation as quickly as possible. So today we're going to share a bit of the best practice that we've built up over time. So before we dive in, just go through the agenda. I'm going to start off by setting the scene and we're going to come up with an idea that we want to implement as our prototype. Then we're going to have a look at some principles for prototyping. Fabian's going to dive deep and we're going to actually go and build uh, the prototype. Then we'll talk about some additional things that you can also do to make your prototyping more robust. So as an organization, we, uh, our fictitious company today will be an e-commerce uh, organization. Uh, we sell products and we've got sort of a modern application, as you'd expect, with a REST-based API in the back end and a bunch of clients in the front end. And we were analyzing uh, customer satisfaction and customer behavior. And one of the specific um, problems that we picked up was that certain customers were buying uh, a product, returning it, and then buying a very almost equivalent product, but maybe from a different manufacturer. Um, and this really got us thinking, like, what could we do to share like, that knowledge that was obviously obtained by the customer, making that first purchase to help inform other customers? So unsurprising to many of you, um, especially those in the e-commerce business, we came up with this idea that we really want to be able to do a product review or have our customers um, submit product reviews. So we basically keep it simple. We want to be able to associate it with a product, a review that includes a title, some text, and a rating for the given product. So now we've got our basic idea, um, but we're faced with this challenge. Like, how are we going to do this? Do we do it right, um, sort of in, in air quotes, or are we going to do it really fast? And this is a common dilemma. It's like, OK, obviously, I want to show off my work as quickly as possible and like, get customer feedback as quickly as possible. Or I can spend um, maybe more time building a well-architected application and you know, spending more time designing it, and et cetera. So at AWS, we really like to challenge these um, constraints and try and find ways that we can be both fast and right um, wherever possible. So let's have a look at some of the principles for prototyping. And this is really just best practice I've built up over time um, in engaging with customers and helping them move quickly. So the first of this is working backwards or work backwards. And work backwards is an AWS or Amazon methodology that we use to determine what products we're going to build. We ask a set of five really specific questions. The first question being, who is your customer? The second, what is the customer problem or opportunity? The third, what is the most important customer benefit? And this is really key because we want to focus on like really delivering that specific thing that will delight the customer rather than sort of trying to solve too many problems at once. And we also want to challenge ourselves and understand like how do we know what the customer needs? And by asking this question, like sometimes it leads us to actually go and talk to customers or find more data or like test ideas with customers before we start writing um, or implementing anything. And then finally, the question is like, what is the experience? What, is, what do we want the experience to look like? So based off of this, we go on and we create uh, two primary artifacts, one being a press release and the other being a frequently asked questions. And the press release is super interesting. And when I talk to customers about this approach, it's we, we create the press release as if we have done the thing, as if we have created and implemented the service that we, we have in mind. And that press release gives us a really interesting tool to challenge and test the idea both internally and externally. Next, at AWS, we always say security is job zero. Um, and so the second principle is like don't do scrappy security. Uh, I think for many organizations, having earning customer trust is hard. Maintaining that trust and ensuring that you treat customer data um, in a, the most secure way that you can is um, super important. So this is definitely not an area that we want to compromise, even when we are trying to move quickly. Third 
principle is a bias fraction with serverless. So what do I mean by this? Bias fraction is an AWS leadership principle, which is really all about sort of recognizing that speed really matters in business. And by being able to move quickly, we can probably validate or invalidate um, whether we've, we're doing the right thing and get feedback um, from customers sooner. But in using serverless technologies, we're also able to move quickly, but without um, exposing ourselves to the need to, for example, manage underlying infrastructure or servers and make use of higher level services like AWS Lambda, where you can just bring your code and AWS will execute it on your behalf, or AWS API Gateway and a managed API Gateway, again, without having to manage the underlying services. So using serverless technologies wherever possible. The next principle is foundation over throwaway. So again, sometimes we start with an idea and we just want to test it super quickly, but it can almost be a blessing and a curse when the idea works. Um, because now if I've built it really quickly and I've not thought about using this as a foundational capability, then I might have to spend a lot of time um, reworking it. And the last thing that you want to do is have to go back to your customers and say, look, that great feature that we released to you that we were testing, yeah, we're going to have to turn that off um, because we need to go and do a bunch of re-engineering to scale it. So really you want to build something that's foundational and that can scale if it works, um, rather than building something that you, you know you're going to throw away later. Then we're going to also, um, kind of related to being foundational, it's also really important to recognize that first impressions are long lasting or first impressions last. And what I mean by this is, you know, as a customer, I guess some of us have experienced this in our own, um, in our own lives. If you go and consume a service for the first time and you have a really good positive experience, then you want to go back and use the service again. But there's so much choice out there. The opposite is also true. So if I go and try and use a service and it doesn't work or it has random failures or you know, I just don't enjoy using the service, then I'm probably not going to come back anytime soon. Um, this also applies to instrumenting and thinking about how you're going to operate your prototype. Even if you're starting at small scale, you want to know when something has gone wrong and be able to react to that from an operational perspective. And then last, but definitely not least, um, infrastructure as code, but really everything as code. Obviously your application logic would probably already be code, with um, the CDK, your infrastructure can also truly now be code. And even things like the operational aspects could be captured as code. So really important to try and do as much as you can in code. And uh, Fabian's going to show us a bit more about that later. So just to summarize, um, these are the principles for prototyping. And let's say we've now applied these principles and we want to now move ahead with this idea for reviews. So we've done our working backwards. We've done a press release and we've kind of ended up with this mock-up um, for the service. So we will have the ability to select the product, input the title, a description for the review, a rating, and submit that. Once submitted, this will um, be submitted up to our backend API. And let's just have a look at what the high-level architecture is that we've defined for this new service. So firstly, we've got our user. Um, they create their review on their device, and they now need to submit that somewhere. That is submitted up to Amazon API Gateway. An API Gateway is a fully managed service that makes it easy for you to create, maintain, monitor, and secure your APIs at any scale. So it's really great. Again, I can start really small and grow and scale as needed. Next up, that um, review needs to be processed. So we're going to use AWS Lambda. And we're going to have a bit of code in Lambda to kind of check that this review um, makes sense and uh, do whatever sort of logic is required at that first level with AWS Lambda. And finally, you know, once we know we've got a valid review, we're going to pass that on to Amazon SQS. And at this stage, that's enough. We want to focus on collecting these reviews. We'll see what we get coming in. Um, and then we'll decide sort of what the next stage is for this uh, prototype. So with that, let's get building and I'll hand over to Fabian. Thank you, Martin. Let's now explore the different options we have to build our prototype. For architects and developers coming from a traditional technical background, 
it's very tempting to jump first into ClickOps. By prototyping using ClickOps, we mean provisioning cloud infrastructure using the provider's web console directly and manually creating each resource. The issue is that ClickOps is a slow, error-prone, and a non-repeatable way to build infrastructure. I personally have started many experiments using ClickOps and soon became frustrated by the tedious work. I knew that you can use declarative tools like CloudFormation to build your infrastructure as code in AWS. So to build my prototype, I started by writing a CloudFormation YAML template and created each of the resources I needed for the prototype, an API gateway, a backend Lambda function, and an SQS queue. But soon I realized that I also needed IAM roles, policies, permissions, methods, a deployment, an API account, API resources, API stages, and more. After all this work, in the end, I needed to create 16 resources and write over 250 lines of YAML. I was very happy with the result. However, my prototype had some issues. While you can enforce least privilege with CloudFormation, I'll be honest. I use a star so the prototype worked quickly. And I also use fixed names for the resources. So now I need to worry about name collisions with other stacks and resources in my account. There's got to be a better way to do this. So I discover AWS Cloud Development Kit, or CDK. With AWS CDK, you define infrastructure as code using existing languages that we are all familiar with, like Python, Java, or TypeScript. The CDK provides a higher level of abstraction over CloudFormation YAML and JSON templates. I like to think about these abstraction layers similar to concepts known by developers already. Like machine code is the lower level of software and languages are translated to machine code so the computer can execute them, AWS APIs are what AWS uses to build resources on your behalf. In my example, assembly would be CloudFormation and higher level languages like Python or Java compared to the AWS CDK. With the CDK, you instantiate an object for each resource you want to create. For example, if I want to create an SQS queue, in this TypeScript example, you instantiate the object using sqs.q and pass parameters, the stack where the resource will be created, a name for the resource, and optional parameters for the SQS queue, like in my example, the maximum size of messages and a delivery delay of 15 seconds. But one of the best parts of the CDK is that you can use your favorite programming language features. We can, for example, create multiple resources with a single loop and use the language string replacement functions to uniquely name these resources. You can also link resources. For example, here I create an SQS queue and also create an SNS topic. And with a single line of code and the power of a method called add subscription, I now have the queue subscribed to my topic. These three lines of code created four resources. And this line alone is responsible for 25 lines of CloudFormation YAML. But let's jump to the real demo, where I'll show you the power of the CDK in action. I start by installing the AWS Cloud Development Kit in my system using Node Package Manager, or NPM. I make a folder for my project and initialize it with the command cdk init. I'm using TypeScript as my language of choice. After a few seconds, the cdk created the necessary scaffolding. I also need to install the required CDK modules for my project. In my case, I need the CDK API gateway module, the CDK Lambda module, and the CDK SQS module. We'll now be working in the TypeScript file created by the CDK under the lib folder. I import the modules we just installed, API Gateway, Lambda, and SQS. I 
I also need to import path to use it in the Lambda properties. Now I'm ready to instantiate my SQS queue, just with a single line of code. I also instantiate the backend Lambda function. For Lambda, I specify a few parameters. For the runtime, we'll choose Node.js. The main handler function will be index that handler. I also want to specify an environment variable. In my case, I want to add the Q URL as a variable for the Lambda to use it. I also need to tell the CDK where my Lambda call is. In my case, I will have a folder inside live called Lambda. I also need to grant permissions to the Lambda function so it can send messages to the queue. And lastly, we need to instantiate the API gateway REST API. In the Lambda REST API parameters, we specify which function is responsible for handling the requests. I'll create a folder for my Lambda code and paste the JavaScript code required to accept requests and send the messages to SQS. Let us spend a few minutes explaining the Lambda function we just wrote. We validate incoming requests from an API gateway, and then we send the messages to an SQS queue. Let's take a look at the validate message code. We'll return false if the message does not have the required fields for the review. In my case, I want a review to have a product ID, a title, a text, and a rating. If the validate message does not return an error, then the write queue message function executes. And the AWS SDK for JavaScript sends a message to the SQS queue with the request data payload. We're ready now to deploy the application to AWS. Let's go back to the demo. If this is the first time you're using the CDK on your AWS account and region, we need to use CDK Bootstrap first. Then we execute CDK deploy. Review the changes and let the CDK create a stack with all the resources. Every time that we run CDK deploy, the CDK will create a new chain set on CloudFormation and deploy these changes to your account. The process may take a few minutes, depending on the type and number of resources that you are deploying. Let's take a look at the CloudFormation console and review the resources that were created. We should have two stacks. One called the CDK Toolkit. These are resources required by the CDK and their application stack. If we click on the resources, we can see that we have 17 total resources, including an API, a Lambda function, and an SQS queue plus all the additional required resources for the application. The CDK also created an output with the API endpoint URL so we can start using it. A few quick notes. You can also use the command CDK dev to review what changes the CDK is making before you execute CDK deploy. Also, version two of the AWS CDK is designed to make writing infrastructure as code in your preferred programming language even easier. For a prototype, we're using CDK version one because CDK version two is still under developer preview. However, it's important to mention the main differences in CDK version two. In CDK version two, Costro library is a single package. So you don't need to import each resource separately. Experimental modules are not included in the main construct. And the CDK version two will require bootstrapping using the modern stack on your account and region. But once the CDK version 2 is generally available, we'll update the code for the prototype. 
we're ready to show our final application. To test our API, I'll use Insomnia, an API client test tool. However, you can use something like Curl or Postman. From the Insomnia client, I already pre-filled the API Gateway endpoint URL and a JSON payload with an example review. I press Send, and we can see that review has been accepted. I'll remove the rating field just to see what happens. I click Send, and we can see that our review has been rejected. Finally, let's use the AWS CLI to pull four messages in the queue. We can see the message with our review is in the queue and ready for downstream processing. I really love the CDK. I wrote 25 lines of code instead of 250 lines of YAML. I have least privileged permissions that are configured for me automatically. I can share or redeploy the stack as many times as I want. It took me minutes instead of hours thanks to the editor call completion and the CDK tooling. And I have infrastructure as code that is testable. After the prototype demo, the team and management is excited. But are we ready to move this code to production? There are still a few issues in the current state. For example, messages in our SQS queue are not encrypted. The API endpoint is unprotected, so anyone with a URL can post reviews. I don't like security by obscurity. And there are no mechanisms for messages that cannot be processed in the queue. I think we can do a little bit better than that. So let's take our current architecture and improve upon. We can add Amazon Cognito to protect the endpoint and only allow reviews by authenticated users. We can also encrypt the SQS queue with KMS and have a dead letter queue for messages that cannot be processed successfully. For the improved version of our prototype, I'll still use the CDK, but I'll add AWS solutions constructs. AWS Solution Constructs is an open source extension of the CDK that provides multi-service, well-architected patterns for quickly defining solutions in code. Some examples of these common patterns are an S3 bucket that triggers a Lambda function to process new and updated objects, a Kinesis Firehose that routes to an S3 bucket, a DynamoDB stream feed into a Lambda function, or a SQS queue subscribed to an SNS topic. These constructs reduce the number of objects and code that you have to manage and also create best practices by default. If we bring back the abstraction layers example, the AWS solutions constructs represent a layer on top of the CDK, similar to what a library or framework like React represents to JavaScript. To build a prototype, we'll use two solutions constructs. First, the Cognito to API Gateway to Lambda. This construct implements a Cognito securing an API gateway Lambda back REST API. And the second solution construct is called Lambda to SQS. This construct implements a Lambda function connected to an SQS queue. AWS Solutions Constructs provides well-architected components. The constructs have opinionated defaults, but also allow for easy customization. For example, in the Lambda to SQS construct, the Lambda configuration includes settings like keep alive and node, less privileged security so only the function can send messages to the queue, X-ray tracing enabled by default, and an environment variable so the queue URL can be used in the Lambda code without hard coding. And the SQS queue already includes a dead-letter queue for us, encryption at rest with KMS, and in transit. But the real power of solutions constructs is when we combine them together. We can use the two constructs that we have now, Cognito to API Gateway to Lambda and Lambda to SQS, and tell the CDK that the Lambda function is common to both constructs. But let me show you the actual CDK code where we define these constructs. First, we instantiate the Cognito to API Gateway to Lambda object. Then we provide properties for the user pool, the Lambda function, and the API gateway. Then we instantiate our second construct, the Lambda to SQS object. 
We now have a prototype that includes authorization, encryption, and error handling. And we use two solution constructs and link them together with a single line of code. Let's jump back to our demo and let me show you the improved application we built with solution constructs and the CDK. If we take a look at the stack created with the CDK and the solutions constructs, now we have an API authorizer in addition to the REST API. You can also see the Cognito user pool, the construct created. And we also have a dead letter queue for messages that fail processing in our reviews queue. Let's go back to Insomnia and test the new API. As expected, we are not authorized to post a review. Insomnia lets you configure a Cognito user we pre-created to test authenticated calls. We add the required authorization header to the request. And now the review is accepted. We can go even further and expand our architecture with more solutions constructs. We currently have the Cognito API Lambda construct together with the Lambda SQS construct. What about if we add the capability to process SQS messages and store the reviews in a DynamoDB table? We can add a new construct called SQS to Lambda and a new construct called Lambda to DynamoDB. Similarly to the last two constructs, we'll share a Lambda function responsible for consuming the messages from SQS and storing the reviews as items in the DynamoDB table. But what about if we want to have a test for dev environment and two production environments in multiple regions, like in EMEA and America? With the CDK, we can do this in a few lines of code. We'll tell the CDK which account and region are associated with each environment, and then we just instantiate our application on each of these environments. Now we can use CDK deploy and specify the stack we want to deploy. But no production-ready prototype is complete without a dashboard and an alarms. When we mean infrastructure as code, we mean everything, including observability and monitoring. So for my prototype, I want to create a CloudWatch dashboard for my application to show the number of, of API requests I'm getting per minute, how long the Lambda function is executing for the 99 percentile, and what is the API latency for the 99 percentile of my customers. I can start by instantiating the dashboard and the CDK the same way I'll do with any other resource. First, we need to instantiate the CloudWatch metrics. Here is the code where I create a new one-minute count metric for the API gateway. Then I can instantiate the new dashboard widget by specifying the width, title, and the metric to be shown. Let's now create an alarm to alert us when the P99 of our Lambda function execution duration exceeds 500 milliseconds. We instantiate the alarm by calling the method createAlarm in the Lambda duration metric. And the last thing that we want to do is to show an annotation in the widget. When we define the widget, we can include an annotation as part of the graph widget properties. After we initialize all the widgets on our dashboard, we just need to call the add widgets method. Here you can see the code where I call the method once per row of widgets that I want to show. I think by now we have a production ready prototype. Let's take a look at the final architecture. We have an API secured by Cognito, a Lambda that validates requests and sends reviews to an SQS queue for downstream processing, Another Lambda processes new messages in the queue and persists the reviews in a DynamoDB table. We also have built-in monitoring and observability with CloudWatch and X-Ray. But the previous diagram only shows our application high-level architecture. However, I want to show you the full picture and all the resources in our stack as are displayed in CloudFormation Designer. Here's where you can really appreciate how much I was able to accomplish by using infrastructure as code. By using the AWS CDK plus AWS Solutions Contracts, my prototype is well-architected, made from four constructs, 
and about 100 lines of TypeScript. It includes 30 resources on multiple environments and multiple regions. And the best part of all is that I did not have to write 820 lines of YAML. So Martin, back to you to tell us what else can we do with our production-ready prototype. That's great, Fabian. It's really like it's amazing to see the evolution from you know, clicking around the console through to using CloudFormation and ultimately CDK and constructs, and it's just incredible what you can do with really not a lot of code. So what else could we do um, given this foundation of using CDK and using constructs? Like one really interesting aspect that I think um, is kind of a game changer to some, in some aspects is the ability to now test your infrastructure while it's code and as code. So we've got a few approaches within CDK for testing your infrastructure. First being snapshots, secondly validation, and then most exciting to me to be honest is the fine-grained assertions. And with these different test capabilities, you can even go as far as implementing test-driven development, where you define the tests or the outcomes that you want to check for um, in your infrastructure, and then build the CDK to see if you've met those, um, those requirements. And when you pass all your tests, you're done with your development. Obviously, you don't need to go all the way to test-driven development. So let's just have a look at some of the test capabilities within CDK. So first off, I mentioned we've got snapshots as a testing capability. And here you can see there's a bit of code. And it's at the last line there, you can see it's synthesizing the CloudFormation stack. And it's matching that to a snapshot. And what this basically means is we've got a reference snapshot. Uh, if we look at the next slide, we'll see we've got uh, the first time I execute this, I get the window on the bottom left. And I've created a reference snapshot. And the next time I do a deployment, in this case, I've changed um, one parameter on the alarm. And you can see that it's really simple to recognize, to see what has changed and then to take an appropriate action. So one action, for example, might be just to pause your pipeline here and have a manual approval step. But with the output of this, like you can really do um, kind of whatever makes sense to your business. But really simple but powerful capability, especially if you've got a known good state um, that you manage for your infrastructure. Next up is validation. And this is really basically unit testing your code and just treating it like any other code. It doesn't matter that it's infrastructure code. So in this example, again, we've got um, read capacity. And we want read capacity, as you can see at the top there, to be between 5 and 20. And uh, in the unit test at the bottom, we're just passing in a value of 3 and testing that we actually get an exception. So Again, by just doing this, you can test that your code is actually, your infrastructure code is actually behaving in the way that you want it to behave. Finally, and this is probably the most exciting bit for me, is using the fine-grained assertions. And yeah, we've got an assertion that you can see is like when this stack is created, I just want to know that the output or the resulting cloud formation contains a DynamoDB table. So I'm just using that assertion. But the assertions are really powerful, and there are a number of different assertions that we can also, for example, check on parameters. So I can check that all the DynamoDBs created, DynamoDB tables created within the stack have encryption turned on. Um, so by doing this, you can really implement tests that validate your best practices, as you could do with, say, AWS Config once the infrastructure is deployed. But the beauty of this is like these tests will run before you actually have to deploy any of your infrastructure. So in addition to using the AWS um, provided solution constructs, you can also build your own. And this is, again, super, super powerful as an organization. You probably have a, you know, a set of applications or stacks that really matter to you and that are reusable across your business. And you've also got a set of best practice or maybe even compliance requirements that you, ways that you require your teams to build. And by capturing and codifying these as reusable um, constructs for your own, own organization, you can enable your teams to build both faster and safer. So hopefully um, you've enjoyed the talk and enjoyed seeing what's possible with uh, the CDK. And just coming back to the principles and kind of summarizing where we're at there, you know, we didn't talk about working backwards as much, but like taking the time to understand a customer requirement and diving deep there. Again, within AWS and Amazon, we actually spend a lot of time doing that before we 
um, jump in to write code because you can actually do a lot of prototyping without having to develop a, a lot of the code itself. Secondly, we weren't scrappy with security because we've used um, constructs that implement best practice. Like we were able to show um, that those best practices are included in our implementation. We've used a lot of serverless technologies and the beauty with that is that this, um, this stack could run for you know, single figure dollar values or really low dollar values um, per month and it will scale as, as you gain traction and as, uh, as you gain adoption. And then we've also got a good foundation that we can extend this and expand on it, it's kind of as Fabian showed you throughout his build, like really um, without re-engineering a lot of things, just adding capability and enhancing the solution. We know we're gonna have good first impressions because we've got, um, again, using the serverless capabilities, we've got a managed infrastructure, a managed um, components that we're using, but we've also got operational monitoring capabilities and we can hook that into our existing operational processes. And finally, everything um, we've done and shown you today is in the code. Um, so all this infrastructure, the application logic, and even the, the monitoring and alerting configs that we can do is being done in the code. So um, if you're interested in seeing more, uh, here's a few sessions you might, might wanna look into. So I mentioned building your own higher order constructs. So there's a session on that, SVS 319. If you're interested in understanding where you can get access to maybe open source constructs or how you can share constructs that you've built, you know, CDK is an open source project and we are like engaging with the community and the community helping each other is really super important. So check out OPN 205. Uh, CDK has also got capability around continuous deployment and pipelines. Uh, we didn't really get into that today, but there's a dedicated session for that, so DOP 305. I'd really recommend checking that out, um, both how you could use CDK to stand up pipelines and also how you can think about using CDK within your pipelines. And then finally, if you're just interested in understanding what's new with CDK and CloudFormation and that whole space, please check out DOP 315. Uh, if you are interested in trying out any of the code or examples that we've used in this presentation, you can access that at the first link. And then you know I've got a link to just CDK, the AWS solution constructs. And uh, I also wanna give a shout out to the AWS CDK workshop. This is a really, really good workshop. If you're just getting started with CDK, it'll take you right from bootstrapping your account for the first time, right through to building your own constructs and doing testing, like really the full um, gamut of capabilities within the CDK. And if you're interested in more of the kind of the softer side, the non-technical side, like how do we use working backwards, uh, here's a link to a blog post from Werner on working backwards. So with that, I'd just like to say thank you very much for your time and uh, your interest in this talk. And thanks Fabian for really um, diving deep and showing us how we could use the CDK to build. So thank you.